Tom Holkenborg, a.k.a. Junkie XL, is a Dutch film composer, multi-instrumentalist, DJ, and YouTuber. I've been a big fan of his YouTube channel, which just hit 100,000 subscribers. You should definitely subscribe to it, too. I'll put the link in the description. While well, I caught up with Tom when I was out in L.A. for the NAMM show, and here's our interview. Hey, everybody. I have a special guest here for the, for uh, this interview today. I have Mr. Tom Junkie XL as he refers to himself. That's how, how you introduce yourself in your, uh, on your YouTube channel. Yeah. Like uh, my friends started calling me Junkie when I was uh, 14, 15 years old. Um, uh, not because of substance, um, but um, because I always spent like time making music and then the XL stands for expanding limits which is pretty open-minded so those of you that are watching this know that he is a big film composer but he also has a great YouTube channel and everybody should subscribe to it and I'm really psyched to be here today I've watched your videos for a long time and, and so I have watched yours <laughs> and, and I've seen I've gotten the tour of the first thing you should watch is Tom's studio first studio tour that he that he did. I mean, that is just unbelievable. Well, most of it, it, it it's like, a, because many, many people, when I left that, uh, the, the, when I did the first studio tour, people left comments it's like, well, yeah, yeah, I'm sure the guy makes money with what he does right now and he's buying everything that he can get. But it's actually not quite how that worked. Um, I used to work in a music store in the eighties and people would trade all that really incredible gear in for nothing. Uh, people would, yeah, I mean, the PS 3300 over there, um, uh, you know, very expensive since, not a great since, but uh, back in the day, very expensive. And they would trade it in, and my boss would be like, I'll give you 50 bucks for that. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I, and I would have a deal with him. Well, that's all the things would be worth. Like, people would yeah, I know. be worth it back then. Yeah, I know. And, and, and it's very hard to explain to people that in 1982, people would come with a memory mode, and you could not give that thing away for free. And now, you you know, if you find it online, it means like 10, 15 grand or something. Uh, so over the course of eight years, and even way after that, I was still in touch with him. He was like, hey, Tom, I, I traded in uh, this and this. You want it? It's like 100 bucks. It's like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll drop by tomorrow. And so it was really great. And then from that point on, uh, I started also looking into periods where gear was really cheap. So mm -hmm. for people out there that are looking for a steal, 96 to 2002 is the golden time period at this point. You can pick up a great emulator sampler, 19 inch, the flagship of what emulator had, you pick it up for 100 bucks. Okay, so bucks. I wanted to ask you this. Are there things that you still look for? Do you get on Reverb and look for things? Like, yes. oh, I really want this. What do you really want? You yeah, so have? I have two types of buy. Uh, the one is the coffee buy. And that is like uh, in the morning, you uh, you drink a cup of coffee. And like, let's let's go to eBay and see what see what's out there. You know, and sometimes you find something great. And then there's the Chardonnay buy. You know, when um, when you have like a couple of glasses of wine uh, in the weekend at night, and then after that, you think it's a great idea to go on eBay to see what's out there. <laughs> <laughs> now those buys can be can be interesting. And so um, one of those was. Uh, an 18 foot church organ that I bought. The only thing I forgot was that it sat really small on the bottom, local pickup only. Oh, so man. I bought a church organ in Portland, Oregon, and now I had to figure out how to get the thing to, uh, to LA. Uh, but I did get it to LA and I actually did use it. So it, it was really great. Okay, but is there any one thing that you're thinking right now that you've been looking for for a while that you really want to find? I, 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 yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I find them, but the, I have a philosophy that I don't want to pay the market value for uh, for me eBay is there it's like a yard sale right right and, and, and you need to walk someone that's like what 100 bucks for this thing you know so I'm, I'm looking for uh, an original fender basement uh, with uh, uh, amp and, and, and hat but there's no way I'm gonna pay four and a half thousand dollars for a fender basement and then fifteen hundred dollars shipping whatever the thing costs <laughs> from, you know so that's not gonna happen so tell me about your process with writing. We, we were talking earlier about your sleeping schedule, about you work all the time. You're kind of an insomniac. Well, I, I, I mean, my work is my hobby. Yeah. And so I, I feel blessed every morning that when I wake up, it's like pitch dark. It's like 2.30, 2.45 when I wake up. And I sit outside with my dog with my first cup of coffee and an M and I see the stars and then eventually around six the sun comes up. It's like, man, what a fucking life. What, what, a, what a great life. And, and so I feel really blessed. And my day starts around three o'clock and between three and eight, nine in the morning, like nobody's here, no phone calls, no emails, nothing. 
Um, maybe my little boy that wakes up in the middle of the night that needs some attention. But other than that, it, 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 that's just writing time for me. And then uh, my assistants come in around nine, and then you know the day starts with uh, with the guys that I do meetings and, and stuff like that. But so. you've already had six hours of, of yes. work time. To give you an idea of some of Tom's film scores, I'm going to intersperse some clips from his YouTube channel so you can get a feel for it. I'm also at my sharpest, like in the, in the morning. Like the moment I wake up, like I'm at my sharpest and really fit. And... Uh, <clears throat> I used to be part of the electronic dance music scene for 25 years and then it, that was just like three o'clock is when you get started right you know? <laughs> so it was like completely reversed and uh but i'm happier with the with the morning schedule definitely. Now, do you ever feel stressed out though when you have a deadline and you do you ever do you ever come in here and say i need some you know inspiration or yeah but I, I, but, but that's where it, absolutely but that's also where um uh, assistants come in like really greatly um, where you constantly feed off each other's uh, and um, I usually hire people that are way more knowledgeable about like one or two aspects about the uh, about music than than I am myself and um, and obviously I have the experience I know a lot of different things from a lot of different things uh, uh, matters so it, it's really great how it works. So if I if I have a, a you know a down period where I'm just like oh man I, I, I don't I, I don't know how to fix this and I'll get my two assistants in and it's like why do you guys think and it's like oh but you should do this and this and this and then it's like oh that's a really great idea and then boom the fire starts burning immediately and boom you you, you continue and likewise they have the same thing where just like they're like Tom can you look at the thing I'm I'm working on over here I I. I for the life of me, I don't know what to do with this thing. And it's like, oh, you should just do this and this. And you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's constantly back and forth. How important is a sound to you to uh, to create ideas? I mean, there aren't, are there just certain sounds that you'll pull up or you'll create and then you just, it'll just make the ideas happen? Well, I, I call myself a full contact composer, which means that I, 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 I'm at my best if I hold something. Whether it's uh, yeah, I just gave you a little tour. Like if 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 it, whether it's a guitar or a bass guitar or or a synth or a, uh, or a, a violin since five six weeks uh, or something else, it just and and it really that really gives me a lot of a lot of inspiration. But sound is very important in general, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I've decided together with Orchestral Tools to release my own brass library, uh, and we're in the process of recording it and, and mixing it. It's like. Sound is like so. It's so. It's so important. Even um, even though you know um, you know what what to do and you know how it's going to turn out, but the fact that you, if you play a string line and that string line sounds absolutely gorgeous, it makes the writing process a whole lot easier. Of course. Same as a great sounding piano or a great sounding guitar. Now, film composition over the last probably 20, 25 years has incorporated synthesis in addition to having orchestral music. Yeah. And it's pretty equal. And and every film composer really needs to be great at both. I totally agree, and that's also what I'm what I'm uh, t uh, teaching my um, um, my students and and uh, and uh, the people that work with me, my assistants. It's like if some people come in and they're like hundred percent electronic guy uh, uh, musicians, and I'm saying like it's very important you understand the uh, the orchestra. And then there's people that come in that you know want to be the next John Williams, and I say, well, I, I I respect that, but you have to know a thing or two about about modern synthesis because. You don't want to be in a situation where you get hired to do a big adventure film that starts out as an orchestral score. But what if the studio halfway through says, you know what, I think we need to modernize the score because it's a little too, uh, a little too old school. And since there is only one guy on the planet that has the, the genius capacity to write music like that at that level, and that is John Williams, Every, everybody else starts to start to sound pretty quickly as not as quite as brilliant, you know. So, uh, and by mixing it up with other music instruments and other styles, you, you 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 all the film composers out there, including myself, can mask that we're all not quite as good as John Williams. <laughs> when you are, are going to a scoring session, how much music will you have recorded? The problem nowadays is it's like uh, where for people that don't uh, quite understand what what the film scoring process is nowadays. It, it, in the old days. 
um, people would sit behind a piano and just figure out the score and, and they had a moviola which was like a you could you could turn that thing and then you could kind of figure out what the tempo needed to be for the scene and if you hear those old school stories it's so absolutely brilliant nightmare right uh, yeah right. Inc incredible though yeah a, a, a really good story is um, uh, so I, I, I did Mad Max with George Miller and George Miller has worked with John Williams and with Jerry Goldsmith and, and with uh, Maurice Schar mm -hmm. uh, and so Maurice is, is a percussion player he doesn't play piano uh, or guitar he's a percussion player and so George and Maurice would have a music review meeting and that music review meeting was basically a few things written on like a, a, you know, a beer coaster uh, and then he would start singing so they watch the picture and Maurice would be like and the violin was coming like and so that was the music review meeting and George was sounds this sort of interesting uh, I, I don't know and then when the score would get recorded and Maurice would then actually con uh, conduct it, I'm not sure if he was a conductor, but the, the score would be played by the full orchestra. George would be like, oh, but I want something completely different. And then on the spot, it needed, it needed to be changed. And the great film composers in the past were just able just, you know, just to do it on the spot, like John Williams or Danny Alfman or Jerry Goldsmith, you name them. They would sit behind the piano and they would spit out parts just like that and really fast and, and, and economic. But for directors, it was a big frustration. And, and technically for the composers too. Now, let's flash to like 2019, where we have computers, we have very complicated software, everything you name it. We can almost mimic the orchestra uh, like to a level of 60%. The other forty percent you get when you get the guys in the room and they're really, really performing with great conductors. Um, but the problem being is because we live in a digital uh, space that technically directors and studios and composers uh, can play around with the final result of the film technically the day before the release. And I've actually worked on films where that was the case. Um, I'm not going to name titles, but since most of these films have a digital release, uh, the the the, the studio can technically send a download link to the theaters worldwide. They download the DCP and they can start playing it the same night. You know, so you could really be working on it yeah, the day forever, before. Forever. Yeah. yeah. And um, so this is this is leading to a few a few problems in, in film scoring. That is that direct the director knows that. And so he he will con continuously give you notes. So if you're working on another project though, if you've committed a certain amount of time on something and then they're still working on this. What yeah. do you do? You just have to deal with it. <laughs> and, and schedules also change because of, um, um, because of how movies work nowadays. So uh, the studio might put a, little, a few feelers out. Uh, and then if the response on social media is not great enough, they might potentially take another release slot, uh, slot that year. Or they might say, oh, this movie is doing so great. We should release that around Christmas. So maybe we should move this film like a little later. And so there's a lot of freedom there. Um, but when it comes to the recording process, um, directors now, because everything is digital, uh, when it comes to the editing side of things, they're so married now to tiny little music details to the picture. So the guy moves his eyes to the left and then the viola line comes in. And then, so when you play it live without click track or just like free conducting, the director would say, hey, it's stop, 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 stop. That you know when the eyes go down, there used to be vi viola line. It's not there anymore, and it's like, well, you oh know, God. it's a little slower. Demoitis, like, basically. Yeah, yeah, is so what you, they you, call you, that. You, yeah, you can. So what do you do? Do you go and do you actually edit the orchestra and move the things? No, everything is done to a hard click, super hard click. If if you if you listen to the the tempo click sometimes on the, on the, you did this great video that I watched. Uh, art metering in uh, prog rock uh -huh. yeah, right yeah uh, so but this is like film scoring all out you know just like tick 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 you know and then it's like okay we're back you know uh just to deal with the accents uh what they call in film scoring mickey mousey yeah if you really follow the the action on screen um, or the, the tempo and meter maps are just insane. And so when you would record a score, you usually have the, the first violinist that looks at the paper and then I would say Bruce. Uh, Bruce Dukoff is my first violinist um, concert master for the LA recordings. And he would say, Bruce, to where you want to take it? And then, and then he looks at the uh, bar nine. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so okay, so we record like eight bars, and then uh, and we punch in, and then we punch in. So there are also uh, composers that want to hear the the piece of music in full. You know, if it's a cue of like nine minutes, they want a full nine minute uh, performance. But with modern click tracks and meter changes and tempo changes, it's pretty tough for these players to do that in two, three takes. Uh, so it's usually better to go, you know, punch in and out. Now, will you ever go to a, a scoring session and then uh, come back and listen and say, you know, I think that the basses need to be reinforced with with a you use cinematic strings or yeah. whatever. And, and uh, like, uh, you know, it's not deep enough or I want to add a little extra. Do you do yeah. things like that? Absolutely. Um, but I have to say, though, that um, um, when, I, when I started recording uh, um, o- uh, classic orchestras uh, as a classical performance, not yeah. stuff that I wrote, but just to, to, uh, because my career actually started as an engineer um, when I was 13, 14. Um, and you would make like so many mistakes and, and it's like, oh, man. How did how did I fuck this up? You know, um, and so you learn as you go. You learn as you go, and and especially <clears throat> from the '90s when I started writing stuff for for strings, the first things I wrote were terrible. Like like so you you would you would have something and, and it and it sounded so bad, and then it would play the Firebirds, and then it sounded so gorgeous, <laughs> and it's like it's like and Tom, it's like, why are you why are you comparing it to the Firebirds? Yeah, it's like, like, yeah, exactly, yeah, and, and I bar there. Yeah, so. There's so much to learn to to write for uh, for an so most of it's it's is in the writing um, to make an orchestra sound really really great and most of it is in the writing. Um, second is um, in combination with the with the conductor. I talked about that a little earlier with Conrad Pope, yeah, uh, who I've been working with um, uh, since a year now. <clears throat> when he conducts my scores, he has such great ideas. It's like two desks to the to the second violin. Uh, two desks to the viola, a viola two desks to the top cello, uh, two basses double the double the lower the lower cellos, or uh, tacit your line, or you know what whatever he would say, and and I would listen to it as like wow, like every, every cue, like he has one or two suggestions like that, and poof, ten percent extra, and wow, it means that I have less to do like in 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 the work after that when it comes to the mixing and, and mastering because that's what I like to do myself as well. But um, yeah, there is something about samples that is really great, and and and, and 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 the combination between a live orchestra and a little bit of uh, uh, sample pushing uh, is really good. There's, there's one video that I released where um, where I um, explain like how you can help. Uh, fixing mistakes that you made yourself, you know, there's like there's nobody to blame but myself, <laughs> nobody else. So, so for instance, when you play, when you have a very important counter line, but you only used six violas to play the counter line, where you have uh, fourteen, fourteen, uh, and they play in octaves, and it's really powerful, and then it's like, man, I should have had like four cellos to join to join that line or something. Yeah. And, but you know, I, it's done now. So it, it it's done, and then we're listening to it, and it's like I really miss something for that line. And then I would take the programmed uh, viola and just boost it like a little bit. And it's funny that if you add a sampled uh, viola line, just like minus fifteen dB yeah. with with the strings, it already the, the line just becomes alive, and you don't even hear that it, it, there's a sample playing underneath. So for me, it's not like. 50 50 it's like it's the live orchestra and then with a little bit of push with uh, with the live samples and it, it and it makes it really good when you do your scoring session you come back here that's all done in pro tools right no cubic they do everything in cubic no no, no uh, but the recording at the, the recording stage, at the it's done in, in, in pro tools okay yeah. so you get a pro tools session how are things broken out because you'll then bring things back here yes and and how do you transfer the i mean there's so much Material? Do you get do you get uh, stem mixes from them and then yeah. import them back into Cubase? Yeah. So what what I what I um, what, the person I usually work with is the, the all talented Alan Meyerson and he's been recording uh, film scores forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, he was also the first guy that wanted to meet me when I came to LA. So I threw out a couple, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll meet you." So we were sitting at a diner like eight o'clock in the morning, drinking coffee and pancakes, and just talk about tech stuff. Um, and so he, he's usually the one that if I'm done recording, you know, you're talking about like sometimes up to 50 microphones. Yes. And, um, so I will give the 50 microphones to him and then he will just, he, he will make that into 
uh, a set of steps. Uh, and I usually want things in uh, quad. The, I know that we work in a 5-1 uh, environment in, in general or, or Atmos, but usually the center speaker is, uh, is left out out of, out of the music, just okay. like a little bit. They want okay. to use the center speaker primarily for dialogue, for dialogue and some right. special effects. Yeah. Um, so I get quad mixes from him and then it's, it, it's easier for me to handle. So I get six or eight quad mixes from him. I import that into Cubase and then I start my mixing process. And another thing is that most directors want total control even over the instrumentation. So you're forced to record strings, brass, woodwinds, percussion, absolutely completely separate. Uh, and, and that makes it very hard sometimes for the, the orchestra to perform, sure. especially if there's like tricky lines that are handed off from the first violins into the flutes and from the flutes into the bassoons, into the clarinets, and then into the cello and the viola, for instance. Uh, so, which now means the violins are playing, it stops, and then it continues. And, and the same for the woodwinds that need to start at a very awkward moment. So usually there's like a little bit of editing involved to, to move the, the recording a little to the left or to the right to make the transition more seamless. But yeah, there's not many film scores at this point that get recorded the old school way with you wow. know with like 75 or 80 people in one room and everybody records at the same time. It does still happen, but it's not the norm. Why do they want to have control of that? Um, sometimes directors would say, you know, I don't like the woodwinds here, just take them out. Or um, I think the brass is not loud enough. We need more brass. Uh, and if you have just a 5-1 mix of the full orchestral recording, it's very, hard, it's very hard to do that. Yeah. Uh, so, but this again, this also comes with that digital age, you know, just want to have control about absolutely every, everything. And, um, and, and sometimes it, it, I've seen remarkable things happening in the mix where the director wants, wants the music loud, but he also wants the dialogue to be heard. So then we could, for instance, take the woodwinds that, that have a tendency to sit in the same frequency range as talking, but just taking it down by two, three dB, you still feel the power of the music, but now the dialogue just really cuts through, like really clear. So these are very cool tools to have uh, when, you're, when you're mixing. The sample libraries are so good nowadays. It's, it's amazing. So, so there's really very little guesswork for the directors nowadays. Yeah, but there's also a downside to it. And the downside is that, um, and, and I noticed this, this now because I just started uh, uh, playing violin five, six weeks ago, and I'm a crappy violinist, so don't get me wrong, but even in the six weeks that I'm playing with this instrument, I want to understand the string instruments. So when you write for a string group, you, uh, well, first of all, my respect for these guys have risen beyond, uh, you know, the roof. You know, it, it was already extremely, I was, I'm always extremely respectful for, for these musicians, but now that I'm trying to play one of the hardest instruments to learn to play, and myself, I'm just like, Man, 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 these guys, you know, 15, 20,000 hours of practice oh, yeah. and getting really good at their instruments. And like, this is a, a quote directly from Conrad. When you stand in front of an orchestra, there's like two to 400,000 hours of extreme experience sitting yeah. in front of you. So you better use it, you know, instead yeah. of... Um, so even with my six weeks crappy violin player, I now <laughs> understand there's like... 10 different ways to play a staccato note. But if you go to a sample library, there's maybe one, maybe two, and then all the ornamental stuff you can do on, on any instrument. Um, and most sample libraries don't offer that very detailed. And if they do offer it, it's going to take five weeks to program a three-minute piece of music. Right. And, and yes, I mean, I get demos from, from uh, bedroom composers, and I'm just baffled how good it sounds. And, but they have all the time in the world right. to, to play around with all these details. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the profession that I'm in, everything needs to be done yesterday. Right. You know, so there's, you, you can focus on, a, on, on like maybe four or five libraries and use the main articulation. So... What I'm heading at is that the writing for films have been dumbed down um, because, you know, because of time, you need to show the director what, it, what, it, what it's like uh, and they fall in love with what it is. So then when you record the live uh, strings on the live brass and you go very ornamental with, with all these things, he would sometimes say, I just want to go back to the samples. I liked it better. Wow. So, so there's, it, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's, it's very tricky. Um, and um, and even the, the 
Um, I, I was uh, talking yesterday very briefly to uh, David Newman, also a mm -hmm. fantastic composer. Yeah. Um, but you know, even he says like he's a he's a paper and pencil guy, and and but he needs to make mock-ups for the for the directors. He needs to show everybody like, expects it now. Yeah, everybody expects it now. Yeah, and I I would say that credit solely goes to one person who I actually call one of my better friends, and that is Mr. Zimmer. Mm -hmm. He he single-handedly changed film scoring forever in uh, in 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 Hollywood because, by, because by introducing of that. the samplers by yeah. introducing the samplers. And, and I think I, I'm not I'm not sure for a fact, but I think his colleague composers just hated him <laughs> just because of that. Because everybody was fine with the, the paper and pencil and just playing stuff on the piano, and then Hans came to town with like you know just racks of, of samplers uh, to showcase uh, the director what what the sound of the film would be, and then. It only took two years, and then everybody wanted that, you know, because it was so incredibly convenient. So, so, you know, whatever happens with Hans, but that is like a it, it, incredible, um, incredible credit, if, if if you will, to you know, to change film scoring forever. You know, it will will never go back to uh, to to the old ways, unfortunately enough, because I am not a paper and pencil guy, but. I see the paper and pencil composing as um, a traditional artisan bakery mm -hmm. uh, in Holland. Every, it was all about bakeries. Like every street corner had a bakery. Most of them are gone right now. They're yeah. massive grocery stores where they sell yeah. pre-produced uh, uh, bread from uh, from factories. And uh, so I really hope that that art form of that traditional, because I am I am not a composer like that. And I look at these people with so much respect and so much and awe. And I, I really hope that that craft is gonna is gonna stay, and and and, and a new league of crafted uh, composers will st will stand up, and not just computer guys. If I were to ask you what your favorite film score of all time is, just from from your fa or your favorite movie with film score, it it's it's a it it um it obviously changes, you know. Um, um, it's one of the videos I really liked that you had was like. Um, uh, ten best bass parts in in the in rock and roll or something like yes. that. Uh, but uh, so, but but that's potentially the the, um, the take that you had on it on that specific that's point right. in time. If we if you do a video next year, it's like oh, I should have included. I just uh, read the comments and I was like, oh no. Yeah, I, can't like, oh, I, I should have that. included John Wetton, you know, when he was playing with Wes with right. with Yes, like yeah. in the late sixties, early seventies. Or oh, we should have Tony Levin in there with like. Uh, I did uh, have Tony King, Levin though. Uh, King Crimson, with, with, not uh, with King Crimson though. I had him with Peter Gabriel, but yeah. Oh yeah, oh, yeah but it, so <laughs> my pick would have been Elephant Talk. How he plays that on the yes. on the stick. On the stick. Well, I did the best keyboard sounds. It was one of my last videos, and I didn't put um, uh, Bob O'Reilly, the Who. I for, and and because I was thinking keyboardists, and I wasn't thinking Pete Townsend, but that's like one of the most classic keyboard parts of all time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like for me, one of the one of the most classic keyboard parts must be Jump. You know, Eddie Van Halen with his I guitar, had it. and and just like walks up to the keyboard. Quack! Great, great, great. I mean, like that, that. That's a total signature part that you just, yeah. you know, it's and always the things that pop into your head first when you when you start to think about these lists. And, and second best best keyboard part would be uh, Miles Davis, uh, the, the life album We Want Miles. Oh yeah. When he had the dream set up, you yeah. know, just Marcus Miller on bass, Mike Stern on guitar, John Schofield on guitar. Yeah. And Mike Stern was like a super young kid yeah. at, at the time. But there was this rack of keyboards, and he would just like walk around with his like trumpet like this, and every now and then, it <laughs> just like a massive orchestral hit, yeah, from one of the keyboards. Like I still remember that. Oh, that was that that, that was uh, those were good times back then. Yeah, because he he um, because because I come from Holland, and one of the great things that Holland has is the festival North Sea Jazz. That's one of the festivals I always wanted to go to. Yeah, uh, it's 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 really great. It's really great. But I mean. He played there in that time period, you know. So I've never seen him before that. I've I've, I've seen him uh, like after Tutu when he made Tutu with uh, Mark Smiller. Uh, one of my favorite records. But back back to uh, film score. Uh, so it changes over time. Um, but one that's always in the top five is Blade Runner, uh, the Vangelis yes. uh, score. Amazing. Um, not only because he uses synthesizers, but it it, it also the way that he used music against uh, what happens in the picture was mm -hmm. very groundbreaking and and that system has been used overused by a lot of different composers yeah. after that um 
then I mean, how can you not? Um, you know, Star Wars, um, John Williams, just like how he, but the orchestra was about to die in, in film scoring, and then boom, Star Wars uh, came out. Even though was Jaws before Star Wars, yeah, uh, like two years or something like yeah. that. Uh, with Jaws, for me, it didn't connect. Um, you know, but then Star Wars was like holy crap. You know, just like how the orchestra got back into. Um, into a film scoring and that movie is filled with so many amazing themes if any composer oh, yeah. on the planet is able to write two bars of that in his whole life you might, you, you, you're going to be happy yeah. uh, and, it, and it just goes on and on and on um, Max Steiner for the first King Kong uh, in, the oh, late, yeah. in the late 30s yeah. um, that was groundbreaking yeah. uh, and, and um, Bernard Herrmann the, the collaboration between Bernard Herrmann and Hitchcock is, is, is uh, incredible and then I have a guilty pleasure uh, okay. and, and that is um, the first Dracula uh, with Christopher Lee uh, and, this awesome. was a, and this was an English composer uh, who was born somewhere in the 1800s and he, I think he did one or two of those movies and then he died you know so it wasn't really the start of a career it was, it was kind of the, <laughs> the end, end of a career kind of the end but his writing is incredible like incredible I need to go back and watch it. I used to love all those Christopher Lee movies. Oh, they're fantastic. I, I, I just went through the... Because that company was called Hammersmith. Uh, uh, Hammersmith? Uh, who did all those horror movies. So that there's four Draculas and then there's like The Hound of Baskerville and, 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 and uh, you know, all that stuff. And it's like really guilty pleasure movies. Like really good. Well, I really love the fact that you have your YouTube channel and, and, get, and share... These things that honestly, Tom, no one would really know about because you can't. You you talk about actually what how you score films in 2019. Where would you ever learn that? Well, I mean, I, I think what's what's great right now, and um, you're a great example of that. And when I started, you know, playing the violin, I was like, oh, let's see if there's stuff on YouTube, and then. Nathan Cole, who is like the first violinist of the LA Phil, has his own like YouTube channel, yeah. like like how how you know with like super beginning lessons for violin, also very uh, very uh, extended, um, and it's just so incredible that everybody is doing that, and uh, it's it's a gift for of, of all of us to to like the young kids out there yeah. to learn stuff. Um, you know, as well as I do when we grew up, there was like nothing like nothing. that. And a really good example is that I was such a big fan of the police uh, when they came out. And I was such, I, I adored um, Andy, you know, the, the Andy guitar Summers, player. Yeah, Andy yeah. Summers, I adored him. And um, so there we are, a special on the BBC, uh, there was a program called The Tube. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they would feature like new bands. So Andy Summers is in there, and I remember the camera going to Andy Summers, and then to his guitar pedals, and back to his amp, and back to Sting. And that little section, uh, recorded on a shitty VCR in 1978 or 1979, I replayed that section hundreds and hundreds of times. What is that guitar pedal? Uh, and what is that amp? Uh, and now you just like Google. Uh, Oh, I want to know what the life set is of Alan Holsworth, or you know, just like or or Steve A, or whatever, whatever great guitar player. Yeah. And boom, it's all there. It's like a guy, one of his texts is like, "Well, Steve likes to play on this kind of amp, and this is the setting, and then with this board, we switch between different. You can find anything, you can find and, anything. and and it's really great. And um, I, I just really hope that you know people take that in and just you know just do something with it because I say this often on my channel is like I am not a a master composer or anything but I just really love what I do and and I love to talk about what I do and it's or the process of elimination is like well what you just did there just doesn't make any sense and I would never do that well that's great you've learned something and then another point would be like oh but I really like what you did that I should really take that to heart and, and study that even more and just look more into that so it, it's either or of the or the process of elimination or uh, you know just like oh yeah that's really great so um, and it's it's the same as your channel. It's like it's a warm channel. You know, people that go there. You know, there's no there's no shitting around, and you know, uh, you know how the internet can be extremely brutal. Oh. And oh yeah, and you know, when you look at people that do these educational uh, videos, it, it the responses are always like very warm and welcoming, yes. and, and and it's really great to see that. You know, there's already so much yelling out there on the on the social media so it's it's nice to have channels where everything just kind of calms down 
the tempo calms down. You make videos between 20 and 40 minutes. I sometimes make them up to an hour. I'm just like, just talking. And it's like, well, guys, pour yourself a coffee. It's Saturday morning and enjoy That's the right. show. You know, it's, like, right. it's time enough. So, Well, Tom, I really appreciate you being my guest, inviting me here to your studio. This is uh, this has been a real uh, real pleasure. And next time we do it in Atlanta, okay? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much. Good to meet you, sir. You too. I'd like to once again thank Tom for being my guest today, and remember to subscribe to Tom's channel. The link will be in the description below, and also subscribe here. Give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Thanks for watching.